In the 18th century, it was apparent that the European powers had left the Islamic world far behind in terms of society, innovation, trade, military, pretty much every category. Europe's influence was growing, and this was most notable in the Islamic world. From the European perspective, there was nothing out of the ordinary, it was just imperialism as usual. But from the Muslim society's perspective, they were being attacked by Europe. And as a response to this, many new Islamic scholars, activists and ideologists attempted to reform their societies and nations so they could prevent the growing presence of Europe in the Islamic world. It is in this era that many new Islamic branches, organizations and ideas have their roots. It was a confusing time because some scholars sought to reform their societies by looking to religion, for example Wahhabism and Salafism. Others looked at it from a political angle. Some discouraged nationalism, others advocated for pan-Islamism or multiculturalism, others preferred secularism, and some scholars tried to balance a little bit of everything. One of those reformists was Jamal al-Din al-Afghani. His ideas preached of a modern state guided by Islamic principles. And although he was unsuccessful, his work strongly influenced the minds of thousands of activists. And one of those peoples was Hassan al-Banna, who would later on lay the foundation of the Muslim Brotherhood. The most evident presence of Europe in the Islamic world was in Egypt's Suez Canal. In order to construct the canal, many French and British technicians immigrated to Egypt. This soon created a unique situation. One side of the canal had a European culture, with many luxurious residences, dance bars, restaurants, etc. While the other side had an Islamic culture and had marketplaces, tea shops, and was home to the poverty-stricken Egyptian workers. Hassan El Banna lived in the Suez Canal zone and experienced firsthand how distinct the European and Islamic cultures were. Al Banna also witnessed how Egyptians were trying to learn English or French and how the Egyptians were trying to learn European manners only to become the low classes of the European culture. So this offended him and it inspired him to establish the Muslim Brotherhood. And that is what he did in 1928. But originally the Muslim Brotherhood was a Muslim version of the Boy Scouts. Their objective was to teach Muslim boys about history, about their heritage and their culture. And most of all, it was meant to teach self-respect. But eventually, the students' fathers and older brothers started to drop in as well. So the Brotherhood began offering evening programs for adults. And these programs became so popular that the Brotherhood opened up new centers. And by the 1930s, the Brotherhood had become a fraternal organization for men. From this, it slowly became a political movement, and the movement declared secular Islam and Egypt's westernized elite as the main enemies of the country. The Muslim Brotherhood opposed nationalism, and they viewed Egypt, Syria, and even Libya as one entity. Instead, they called on all Muslims to re-establish the Ummah and the Khalifat. So, like Jamal ad-Din al-Afghani, the Muslim Brotherhood preached pan-Islamic modernization without westernization. The Muslim Brotherhood was taking shape around the time that the United States was struggling with the Great Depression. In the same period, the Nazis were taking over Germany, and Stalin was reinforcing his grip on the Soviet Union. Outside of Egypt, no one knew much about the Brotherhood, basically because it had no support among the Egyptian elite. In 1946, they started to conduct several armed operations against the British inside Egypt. As westernization and industrialization continued in Egypt, the working class kept proliferating, and with the expansion of this class, the Brotherhood grew bigger and bigger. At a point, the organization grew so large that it became an insurgency fighting against its own modernist elite against its own government and even against secularism and democracy because they viewed these as western ideas. By 1948 the movement had 2000 branches and half a million members and sympathizers. They built schools, hospitals and pharmacies and their reputation and popularity grew. 
The Muslim Brotherhood became so influential that it threatened the Egyptian government and the elite. So the Egyptian Prime Minister disbanded the Brotherhood, impounded its assets and arrested many of its core members. This led to a conflict between the monarchy and government against the Muslim Brotherhood. And after many bombings and assassination attempts, the Prime Minister of the country was assassinated by the Brotherhood. In return, the government retaliated by assassinating the founder, al Banna. This was a setback for the movement, but by 1952, military officers overthrew the monarchy with the support of the Brotherhood. But the military junta had a different political view. It was secular as opposed to the Brotherhood. So the new military rulers did not want to share their power and clashed with the Brotherhood. The new president of Egypt, Gamal Abdel Nasser, then abolished the Brotherhood and imprisoned thousands of its members. But in the 1970s, the Brotherhood strikes back when they assassinated the second president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat. After this, the Brotherhood became somewhat of an illegal tool for the government's domestic policies. Some members were released, only to be arrested later on. Others were executed, there were fake trials, etc. It was in this period that the Muslim Brotherhood really adapted the non-violent reformist strategy. Some members called it an outrage and demanded a violent revolution as a means to achieve their goals. And they left the organization and established new splinter groups. One of those groups was Hamas. But the Brotherhood itself remained committed to the non-violent strategy. In the next decades, there were many clashes between the government and the Muslim Brotherhood. Its members were arrested, tortured and persecuted. But this quickly backfired when the people who resented the government sought to turn to the opposition. And what more powerful opposition than the Brotherhood? So sympathy towards the organization grew tremendously among the Egyptians and by the 2000s it was experiencing a revival in Egypt. This in the end helped bring the Muslim Brotherhood to power after the overthrow of Mubarak. It was after all the second most organized group after the military. The Muslim Brotherhood has come a long way. It was born as a reaction to European imperialism and grew from a small Islamic boy scout group into an influential political organization with many branches in foreign countries. It is this influence that has many people alarmed and there are many misconceptions about the group. Some say it's a radical ultra-conservative organization and others say it's liberal and democratic. But the truth is somewhere in the middle. In its core, the Muslim Brotherhood is a political organization, not a religious one. Its mission is to modernize the country without actually westernizing. That means it's guided by Islamic principles, but it's also pragmatic in its decisions. For example, it may claim to be anti-American and it may condemn Israel, but they will never want an open confrontation with these countries. The Brotherhood also has inconsistent positions and principles in every country. In Kuwait, they oppose gender equality and in Egypt, they promote women's suffrage. So it's a very flexible organization. And for most of its history, the Muslim Brotherhood was an underground organization. It was never really in power. But by winning the 2012 elections in Egypt, they are now in a unique position and they have a lot of challenges ahead of them. Not only do they have to find a balance with the military faction, the secularists, the conservatives, but they also have to reform the economy and the society and all of this within the constitution. Their success, failures and decisions will reflect how they will be perceived by the world. This was a Caspian report by Mishirwan. Thank you for watching and Sagol.